Okay, so we're going to start today by going over what I think are the most exciting developments in the field of single cell genomics over the past year. I have eight areas that I want to highlight today, uh, four computational and four experimental. And the goal is not to go into too much detail for any individual method, um, but I hope to really summarize the intuition behind each approach, you know, why I'm excited about it, um, and maybe even convince you to give it a try. And everything on this list is something that we think you should be aware of, um, even if it's only in preprint form. Um, in fact, we've made a particular effort to prioritize uh, methods on this list that are in preprint form because many of you may not have even seen them yet, but they could be very valuable for your work. And if you find these methods intriguing, we hope that you'll check them out and read the paper. Now this year, I'm gonna try something slightly different. Um, I'll try to give some historical perspective on new methods and to call out some of the older work that kind of paved the way for where we are now. Uh, that takes some time, which is why I'm only doing um, eight methods this year uh, instead of my usual 10. Uh, and we'll make a video of this talk available after the workshop uh, on this website. Uh, and I hope that'll be helpful for you. Okay, so our first highlight today represents a challenge that the field has really been focused on, you know, from its inception. How do we profile cells, not just in steady state, um, but as a transition over time? Now, we are of course generating snapshot data with single cell sequencing. Um, and so we lose the temporal component when we profile the cell. Um, but that temporal component is immensely important and it's something we really want to be able to understand. So there are many different strategies that people have used to solve this problem. I'll remind you of some old ones and show you some new ones. The first approach was to perform computational inference. So for example, to learn developmental trajectories or pseudo time, uh, assuming that cells take kind of a smooth path through molecular space. And if they do, um, we can reconstruct their developmental progression. So that's one way. Uh, another way is to infer RNA velocity, which uses the ratio of splice and unspliced reads to infer transcriptional dynamics. Now, these are, of course, valuable tools, but they are computational inferences. We don't have any way of knowing for sure if the trajectories that they return really represent real biological time. And so it would be amazing if there was some way that we could inject some form of ground truth about time into the data. Um, that would be really exciting. Um, and the method that I'll show you today um, actually do perform a physical injection. So the first is called LiveSeq. This was published from Bart de Planck's lab. Um, and basically what it enables you to do is to actually take a small amount of mRNA from a cell cytoplasm, basically to, to do a biopsy with a very small pipette. Um, and then you sequence its RNA. But that, that biopsy is minimally invasive, so the cell actually stays alive. So after you profile it, you can watch it under the microscope for a while, you can wait, and then you can go back and take another sample later. So it's basically non-destructive single-cell RNA-seq. Um, and now when you see an arrow on this plot, it's literally looking at the same cell from two different time points. So, you know, obviously this is incredible, but extremely challenging. You know, the authors were only able to generate repeated measurements um, successfully for on the order of about 10 cells. Um, and it really does have to be done in vitro. Um, so as exciting as this is, you know, the question is, is there something in the middle, something that does have experimental ground truth, um, but is also highly scalable? Um, and that's what I want to show you. So this year, Ido Amit's lab introduced ZMANSEQ. Um, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but it references the Hebrew name for time. Um, and the way this works is you inject fluorescently labeled antibodies into a mouse. And those antibodies will attach themselves to circulating immune cells. And you can use different colors. So at 12 hours, for example, you can label a subset of immune cells red. And at 24 hours, you can label them green and so on. So those labels stay attached to the cells. So they're like timestamps that tell you when the cell was in circulation and when it was barcoded. So if you ever see a green cell anywhere in the body, you know, let's say you find it 10 minutes later in a tumor, uh, you know it must have just entered um, because it's green. And that's what the Amit lab wanted to study. They wanted to understand when immune cells enter a glioblastoma tumor, how do they change their state over time? And this is exactly what the timestamp gives them. Because the longer that the cell spends in circulation, the less time it can spend in the actual tumor. So that's ground truth. Um, and that inverse relationship, by the way, that's what inspired Tracy to develop the sort of back to the future idea um, in our, our conference logo. 
So this is what uh, ZMAN seq data looks like. Um, on one hand, you have standard single cell RNA seq data, just like you usually do. Uh, but you also have these timestamps from each cell that you get from flow cytometry. And they tell you how long the cell has spent in the tumor. And so you can see on the bottom here that the distribution of cell states changes between cells that have very recently entered the tumor and cells that have been in the tumor for 36 hours. Uh, and so now we can study this transition. So for example, the authors found that NK cells in the tumor were present in a variety of states, ranging from chemotactic to cytotoxic and eventually to dysfunctional. And they can infer a trajectory from this data. And they can see exactly what genes are upregulated and downregulated as cells spend more and more time in the tumor. So that data is really quite exciting for, for understanding cellular exhaustion and, and immunotherapy. But the key conceptual advance here is that when you build these trajectories, you can use the timestamps to actually guide the trajectory inference. So it's a middle ground. They aren't sequencing the same cell repeatedly over time. They're still making trajectory inferences, but they're guiding those inferences with real ground truth barcodes of cellular time. Now, this system isn't going to work for everyone. It's not going to solve the problem in all cases, uh, but it is a conceptual leap forward. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about this work, uh, Ido is one of our keynote speakers today, um, and he'll be speaking at 3 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. So, so please stay tuned. All right, so we'll trans transition now to a field of computational research, which has certainly generated a lot of excitement in the community, the use of foundation models to understand cellular biology. So the term foundation model is not terribly well-defined, and in essence, it's just a model that's trained on a huge corpus of data. So for ChatGPT, for example, the training data is, is basically just a scrape of the internet. And that initial model, when you train it, it's just trying to learn patterns. You know, what are the words that tend to appear together um, and in what order? And those patterns hopefully reflect the rules of language. But the reason it's called a foundation model is that after learning these very general rules, then you can apply the model to diverse downstream tasks. So you can do some additional training with a small amount of additional data, you know, it's known as, known as fine tuning. And now you can teach the model to do specific tasks. We teach it to answer questions, to draw images, or to write rhyming poems, you know, whatever we ask ChatGPT to do. But all of that comes from this huge corpus of data from initial training. And the idea is that we can extend this to single cell genomics as well. So there have been a series of papers that exploit this, and they all follow a, a roughly similar structure. So the first that I'll mention is the gene former model from Patrick Eleanor's lab. And this paper mined about 30 million cells of human single cell RNA-seq data, representing about 561 data sets across a wide variety of tissues. And they built a self, uh, a transformer model with self-supervised learning. The goal of that was just to try to understand which genes tend to be expressed together, you know, kind of like learning the rules of language. And then they applied this model with some fine tuning to a variety of downstream tasks, including predicting chromatin dynamics or even identifying therapeutic disease targets. Now, before I show any new results, I'll also mention another similar idea from Bo Wang's lab, um, and this is called SCGPT. And again, this was trained on a very large corpus of, of single cell RNA-seq data. In this case, they used a cell by gene platform um, from CZI. And they applied this pre-trained model, again, with some fine tuning to a very broad variety of downstream tasks, including clustering, annotation. Um, but one of the interesting claims of this paper was the ability to also be able to predict genetic perturbation data. Now that's kind of a leap because the model is, is primarily trained on observational data without perturbation. Um, but there is some fine tuning with perturbseq and, and the, that claim that you can predict totally new perturbations that the model has never seen before is potentially very exciting. Um, and the gene former paper also has similar goals of being able to predict the effect of different genetic knockouts. So I'll encourage you to read these papers and get a sense of how these models really perform both technically and biologically. Um, I'm definitely excited, uh, not completely sold. I think it's very hard to predict the results of experiments that a model hasn't seen before. Um, but I do think these methods demonstrate a first step in the right direction, um, but it's a hard problem. Uh, and I also think that these methods um, and their metrics can sometimes be focused on, on very highly expressed genes like ribosomal proteins or housekeeping genes, um, even if they're not the most biologically relevant. Um, but this is for sure an exciting and growing field. And, and as the data grow and, and the models get better, it, it is really exciting to dream about what's possible. Another paper in this field treats the idea of a foundation model in a slightly different way. 
Um, it's a universal cell embedding model from the Leskovich lab at Stanford. Um, and they accumulate a huge corpus of data again, but instead of trying to prefer, perform diverse tasks or you know, predict downstream perturbations, the authors take a little bit of a different approach. Um, instead of focusing on human, they embed data from eight different species together into the same latent space. And so the idea is now this model is not human specific, but it's, it's universal so that any cell from any species can in principle be mapped to this without any additional fine tuning. So that's quite an exciting goal. You know, another aspect of this work that I really appreciate is that they bring in another layer of information to the model, and that is the protein sequence of the gene. And the idea, which is of course true, is that genes that have similar protein sequences, both within and across species, are more likely to have conserved functions. And I think that really helps the model's performance um, in multiple ways. So I won't show any results here. And the reason for that is Yanai Rosen, who led this work um, at, at Stanford, is one of our speakers. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about deep learning or foundation models, um, please do stay for his talk. All right, our next experimental highlight also addresses a longstanding challenge in the field, the, the idea of being able to identify cells that physically interact with each other. Um, and again, I want to start with some historical context. In 2018, Rosa Ventotormo and Sarah Teichman released cell phone DB and presented the idea that by looking at the level of a ligand and receptor that two different cells expressed, you could infer that they interacted. Now, these are, these are tools that have been used by many labs, including our own, um, to generate hypotheses. But of course, there's no ground truth. Just because cells possess the machinery to interact doesn't necessarily mean that they do. Um, so that year, Alex Van Newton-Darton's group uh, also released a, a method called Proxim ID. This is very clever. Basically, you take a tissue and you do a mild dissociation. Um, creating small clumps of interacting cells. Um, you then fully dissociate them and do single cell RNA-seq, but you know who was in the same clump, so you know who interacted. Also a beautiful idea, uh, but it is very, very challenging to do this at scale. So again, we need a middle ground. We want some experimental ground truth, but we also want to be highly scalable. Um, and this year, the idea came from Gabriel Victoria's lab at, at Rockefeller. It's a method called lipstick, um, and I'll tell you how it works. It uses an enzyme from bacteria called SRTA, and that enzyme is loaded with a peptide that it can physically transfer to an acceptor protein if it comes close enough. So suppose that you have a T cell that expresses this SRTA enzyme, that's called the donor, okay? And then you have an dendritic cell that expresses the acceptor. Now, if and only if these cells come into close contact, less than 14 nanometers, then the peptide will be transferred. And now the dendritic cell will carry a mark of the fact that it has previously interacted with a T cell. And that is a ground truth stamp. So, you know, I think the lipstick name and analogy here is, is pretty self-explanatory, um, but it really is an ingenious way to permanently mark an interacting acceptor cell. Now, the authors use some very ingenious genetic tricks to get the system into mice. Um, I won't have time to go into them, but I'll, I'll show you a cool result. Um, the authors generated these lipstick mice, and then they labeled intestinal epithelial cells, and only those cells with the donor enzyme. So those are the cells that have the lipstick, and they can spread it around. And the question is, which immune cells interact with these donor epithelial cells? And to find out, now you can do single-cell RNA-seq. So you get you know, your regular single-cell RNA-seq data, you can cluster, you can call cell types, but you can also use an antibody against the transferred peptide, it's basically a biotin antibody, and if the cells bind this antibody, then we know they interacted with the donor cell. So you get this extra layer of interaction information. You can see it here. You can see that some cell types basically don't interact. Um, some cell types always do. And some cell, cell, some cell types are heterogeneous. There's a mixture of interacting and non-interacting members, and you can find out what's different about their transcriptomes. So that process of physically barcoding an interaction, that is highly innovative and unique. And, and I'm excited to see where the Victoria Lab uh, and others uh, take this approach. And if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, Sandra from Gabriel's Lab is, is our last speaker of the day. Uh, and I hope you're able to stay to the end to hear about this beautiful work. All right, so now I'll transition back to computation, um, but I'll stay on the theme of giving some historical context. So I actually showed this slide at Single Cell Genomics Day maybe four or five years ago. It's a comment um, in 2011 um, from Jimmy Yee, who was a postdoc with me at the time. Um, and he was annoyed that he was actually getting too many mitochondrial DNA reads in his ataxic libraries. And so him and others started developing protocols to actually deplete mitochondrial reads from sequencing libraries. They thought it was junk. 
That is until Leif Ludwig, Caleb Leroux, and other, others realized that you could actually use these mitochondrial DNA reads for lineage tracing, but you needed a lot of them. So then people started developing protocols to, to enrich, to get even more mitochondrial reads. So, you know, I won't go into this work in any more detail, but it's a beautiful example, really, of how one man's junk can be another man's treasure in genomics. And we do really throw away a lot of information, like the mitochondrial reads, um, every time we analyze a sequencing experiment with a standard pipeline. And I think this experience, you know, probably had quite an impact on Caleb. The reads that we throw away, of course, in a standard analysis are the ones that don't map to the reference, but they may still have value. So some of those reads, maybe a lot of those reads even may be junk, but trying to understand which ones are valuable systematically is something that a number of groups are starting to ask. So Caleb had another story last year where he did single cell RNA-seq of CAR T cells, which are of course a very promising uh, cancer therapy. Um, and he found something quite striking, which is that there was a small subset of CAR T cells that expressed a huge number of viral reads from herpes virus. Um, not all the cells, you know, less than 1% of them, but they expressed thousands of viral RNA copies um, while most cells express zero. Um, and these cells, these super expressors, um, likely can cause adverse effects for the patient, including encephalitis. So that's a very interesting biological result, but the reason I'm flagging it for you today is that every single one of those viral reads would have been thrown away in a standard analysis. It's just sitting there in those unmapped reads that we typically throw away. And a number of labs, including EDOMA's lab, have demonstrated that you can create a viral reference to map and quantify these reads. And maybe we should be doing that very routinely because there's clearly information in that data. But Julia Salzman's lab at Stanford has been thinking about how to take this one step further. And they built a method called SPLASH, which doesn't use any reference at all. It doesn't even align reads. It just looks for sequencing pattern. And I'll try to explain to you how it works. So as an example, let's suppose that you have a wild type gene sequence here um, that sequence has many patterns of letters. Here's just one pattern. There is a former GAAA and another former CATT, and they are located three bases apart. So every time you see a read representing this gene, you'll see this pattern. But what if there's a mutation or an RNA edit or an insertion or a splicing change? Then the sequence is going to change and the pattern breaks. And if you have enough data and you have good statistics, you can say, okay, this sample is producing reads with a different sequence pattern from what I am used to seeing. And now you can analyze all sorts of sequencing changes from splicing changes to gene fusions to hypermutating sequences, even if those reads wouldn't map under a traditional pipeline. So you can see the paper for more detail. I'll show you a couple examples of what you can find with this type of method. Um, these are actually applied to single cell rna seq data in a follow-up paper. Um, if you look on top, you can see the RAB36 transcript. That's a, an RAS, a RAS oncogene. Now, in most cancers, only one form of this isoform, only one isoform of this gene is expressed, and, and that's the one that's annotated, the blue one. But in lymphoma, a second unannotated isoform is expressed, and in fact, it becomes a predominant isoform. Um, now, in a standard analysis, that read wouldn't map because it's unannotated, but in splash, it changes the sequence pattern, and that enables you to detect this new splice site as being highly variable. The manuscript goes through a number of these examples, which I'll encourage you to read. Um, but my point is this, you know, you may not want, want or, or need to use these methods right away, right now in your own work, but as a broader point, there is information in the trash. There's information in the reads that we typically don't align. And we're just starting to think in detail about how to make sense of it. Um, and I think that's really a very exciting trend. All right, now we're gonna to switch to the first of our spatial technologies and methods. So first we're gonna talk about um, sequencing-based spatial technologies, and then we'll switch to in situ imaging-based approaches. Now for historical context, many of you are familiar with spatial transcriptomics from Skylife, now commercialized by 10X as the Visium technology. And, and the essence of this is these are RNA capture arrays that you can put your own tissue slice onto, and you buy those RNA capture arrays from a commercial vendor. But what if you could make your own? And what if you could make them at significantly higher resolution using equipment that you already have in your own lab. So that would be do-it-yourself, high-resolution spatial transcriptomics. And, and two groups have demonstrated how to do that this year. They use the Illumina NovaSeq flow cell, which is you know, about the size of, of your hand. Um, so the, again, there are two labs, amazingly, the Ryevsky and, and Ertz labs that both have this idea. They published preprints that you can read. Um, it's a complex idea, but I'm gonna try to give you the basic intuition. It's quite exciting. So basically what you do is you pour a bunch of barcoded oligos randomly all over the flow cell. 
And then you run the NovaSeq, which does two things. The first is it makes many, many copies of each oligo in the same spatial location. That's called bridge amplification. And that's exactly what you need to be able to create a spatial capture array. The second thing it does is it sequences those oligos. So now you know exactly which barcode corresponds to which spatial location. So at this point, you're done. At this point, you've basically made your own massive sort of hand-sized, enormous spatial barcoded RNA capture array. In fact, it's far too big for one experiment. Um, and so what you do is you actually take, I mean, this, this sounds crazy, but it's real. You take a diamond cutter and you cut the flow cell into lots and lots of very, very small pieces. I'm showing you a screenshot from a video that the Rayovsky lab has made. It's actually pretty easy to do. But in one sort of bake of this spatial array, you, as a result, you generate hundreds of spatial transcriptomics arrays for individual experiments, um, actually at quite a cheap cost. And you know, once you have these arrays, um, now you can just put them on your sample on top of the slide and, and you can go ahead and make your libraries and, and you can generate spatial transcriptomics data at something like one micron resolution. You can do this from the mouse brain, you can do this from a human primary sample, from tumors. Um, it, you know, they estimate something like $200 per array, which is probably an order of magnitude cheaper than the next commercial option. And what the Ryeski lab demonstrates is that this method is cheap enough to run actually on dozens of consecutive serial sections, so cheap that you can actually stack them up in 3D. Um, and at this point, you can generate an entire 3D tissue block with spatially resolved transcriptomics. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about this method, you don't have to wait for too long. Uh, Marie and, and Daniel from the Ryeski lab will be presenting on this work later in the session. And, you know, look, I, I don't think, you know, all of you should necessarily go out and start buying diamond cutters. But, you know, over the last 10 years, I've learned how important DIY methods really are for driving innovation in the field. Those of you who ever set up DropSeq or SplitSeq know exactly what I'm talking about. But we really haven't had DIY options for spatial analysis that most labs could run with the equipment they already have. And, and this is one of the first options that I've seen. And I'm really excited to see the impact that this has um, and how the community uses it. All right, so now let's move to in situ spatial analysis. So here you, you do need some advanced equipment on microscopy. DIY is not really an option for most labs, but there are a suite of sort of academic and commercial options that are available for in situ analysis. And interestingly, many of these platforms have released data from the mouse brain. Now, Austin Hartman, who was a computational biologist in my lab, had built infrastructure to analyze data from all these technologies in Surat. Uh, and we thought, you know, now that we've loaded all of them in, you know, we could do a benchmark analysis since the biological system was the same. Now, we didn't generate these data. The authors of each technology did, but that also meant that they had the opportunity to present their technology in the best light. So for benchmarking, you know, we thought this would be easy. With single cell RNA-seq, one of the most important metrics is the number of molecules per cell. We can do the same thing with spatial, more is better. But we can also see that even though there's a range of counts, it's actually very, very difficult to interpret these metrics. And there's two reasons for that. The first is that in in situ data, um, the, situ the, the, the panels that these different technologies use are all very, very different. So that really complicates the situation. You know, we knew this would be an issue. Um, we found some ways to try to address this, for example, looking only at overlapping genes between two technologies. And you can read about that analysis in the paper. But the bigger issue that I hadn't expected and we found it when we plotted markers of, about, of, of astrocytes versus markers of neuronal cells. Now, now, these are mutually exclusive markers. They should not be detected inside the same cell. And in single cell RNA-seq data, they're mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. But in in situ data, we could see that they were expression was anti-correlated, but we did see co-expression at variable levels across technologies. And we wondered why that was. And it turns out this is a form of non-specific signal, and we think it comes from challenges in cell segmentation. So I'm showing you cell segmentations. These are the white boundaries from two different technologies here, and, and you can see that they look very different. One is a bit more aggressive with larger cell boundaries, and one is more conservative with smaller boundaries. And of course, the, the larger cell boundaries will capture more molecules. Now, I'm not trying to argue that one of these is right and one of these is wrong. Um, you know, segmentation is challenging for all these technologies, but what I am arguing, though, is that we cannot compare molecular counts from two data sets where one has large segmentations and the other has small segmentations. It's a fundamentally unfair comparison. And so what that means is that when we benchmark across in situ technologies, we can't just use the outputs that the authors give us. They're, they're not comparable. And so what we did is we developed metrics and segmentation pipelines to control for this phenomenon. And you can read about them in the paper. 
But the point about them is, is now we can compare the sensitivity of different technologies in a principled and controlled way. Um, and if we want, we can even rank them. Um, now, what I've done here is I've actually taken the technology names off. Uh, you can read the preprint if you want to see them. And I'm doing that because our goal here is, is actually not to declare a winner. All these technologies is, are changing. They're rolling out new chemistries and, and new panels. Um, so the rankings can and will change. But we do want to start to establish a framework for how to compare these data sets going forward. And I hope our paper helps with that process. I also want to mention two other papers that also did in-depth spatial benchmarking. Um, unlike us, they actually generate their own data. The first is from David Cook and, and Luciano Marcelletto, and, and they benchmarked the Tenexenium and Nanostring Cosmics technologies. They used a cancer sample, and what was really nice here is they did a real head-to-head -head comparison with serial sessions, kind of as close to replicates as, as you're going to get. And they found something interesting, which has sort of been a theme across these benchmarks. You know, from a biological perspective, the two technologies perform pretty similarly. You can generally see the same clusters, they localize to the same regions of the tissue. So, you know, everything works, it passes sanity checks. Um, but they do see very different technical performance, in particular in signal to noise, the ratio between the expression of background negative controls and the expression of two true target probes, you know, differed quite a bit across technologies. And again, that highlights the importance of considering background expression when looking at in situ data. The third paper came from Sammy Farhi's group at the Broad Institute. They generated a huge resource of in situ data from 23 different FFPE tissues, over a million cells on three different commercial platforms. There's a huge amount of data in here, far too much for me to summarize. You know, I'll encourage you to read the paper, but again, at, at, at the broad level, some of the conclusions are similar to what I've stated before. Biologically, the results across platforms are quite similar. You know, the canonical markers of, of types of cell types and tissues replicate well. But there are differences um, in sensitivity um, across these technologies. So if you're interested in this, there's a lot to read and learn about. Um, but you can also uh, tune in to Austin Hartman, who led the work from my lab. He's going to be discussing all three of these papers and is speaking here this afternoon. Um, and he will show the, the technology names. All right, so now I want to pivot away from the, the spatial field and, and move towards a completely different analytical challenge in, in genomics. And this is one that has personally fascinated me and, and maybe many of you, you know, ever since joining this field. In genomics, we are incredibly good at making measurements. We can look at healthy and disease samples like I'm showing you, and we can enumerate hundreds of differentially expressed genes that change. Using single cell technologies, we can even know that they're cell type specific. But how do we distinguish correlation from causation? How do we move beyond this sort of descriptive analysis towards a more causal understanding of molecular regulation? And I think over the past few years, there's been really an interesting analogy that's emerged. You know, we use single cell RNA-seq because we can profile multiple cell types and states all in the same experiment all at once. And we can start to build atlases of cell types and map new data on top of them. The same can, of course, also be true of perturbation experiments. We don't have to do the perturbations one at a time. We can multiplex perturbations. They can be chemical. They can be genetic. Um, and we can read them all out simultaneously. And if you do this enough, you can start building an atlas or a dictionary of cellular perturbations. And then you can map new data on top of these as well. And so I'm just going to show you two examples, although there are more for sure in the literature. And, and the first is the immune dictionary from Nir Cohen's lab at the Broad. Um, Nir was a close collaborator of mine when I was a postdoc and worked with us on our very first single cell experiments. Um, but here is lab did a very cool analysis. They administered 86 cytokines separately into mice. So it's a chemical perturbation, and they know which mice, uh, which mouse got which injection. Um, and then they collect their lymph nodes um, and they do uh, single cell RNA seq. Um, so what they can do is they can build a map um, or a dictionary, as they call it. Um, of how about 1,700 different immune, of 1,700 different immune responses, that's basically 20 cell types um, times 86 different cytokines. And in each of those immune responses, they can see how uh, cells uh, change their gene expression. Um, and they find that different cytokines push different immune cells um, into different states. So for example, in their data set, they find that NK cells can take on a, quite a variety of states, um, but each state is enriched for cells that come from mice stimulated with different cytokines. So, you know, if you're in NK cell A, it's very likely that you've been pushed there by exposure from interferon alpha or interferon beta. Um, IL-1A and IL-1B push cells into a different polariz polarization state, and ILT induces a unique response also in NK cells. So, you know, on one hand, this is not surprising. It's not surprising that cytokines, you know, influence cells to, to change their states. Um, but what is incredibly valuable 
is to map all of these changes systematically to build this dictionary. And the reason this is so valuable is that now you can go to a disease data set and you can look at your list of DE genes and you can translate them. You can say, okay, we think that these cells have been targeted by a particular cytokine or signaling pathway. Um, and the, the authors actually have a tool and a website where you can upload your DE gene list and it will tell you, you know, it thinks that your cells are invoking an IL-15 response. It might also be IL-2 IL or interferon alpha, but it's probably not interferon gamma. Um, and that's why we build dictionaries. And I think this is a really nice example um, of how they can be impactful. Now, the Hakoan lab did chemical perturbations, um, but we were interested in pursuing a similar idea, at least conceptually, um, with genetic perturbations. Um, so this was a project led by Long Da Jiang and Carol Dargano in, in my lab. Um, and their goal was to build a dictionary of signaling pathway targets across human cell lines. Now, if you want to study signaling responses, you need to expose cells to a variety of different ligands. So we chose to stimulate cells with five different ligands. Um, and we also wanted to study multiple different biological contexts. So we chose six different cell lines. So that's a total of 30 different biological samples. And then in each sample, we ran perturb-seq against known transcription factors and signaling pathway regulators. Um, so we profiled a few million cells, um, and we did this with a high throughput perturb-seq workflow using both parse biosciences um, and sequencing with Ultima Genomics. Um, and so the raw output of our study is actually just kind of thousands of heat maps um, telling us exactly what genes are affected um, by a specific regulator in a specific cell line and after exposure to a specific ligand. So it's a lot of data, and we built a statistical pipeline to squeeze as much information out of the data as we could and to really learn these uniform pathway responses. Um, so if you're interested in some of those methods, um, please do check out our preprint or stay for uh, Longda and Carol's talk here later today. Um, but basically, we're trying to build a complementary version of gene ontology or, or enrichment or, or MCDB. Um, and it really does work very well. Um, when we compare um, to what's been previously learned for MCDB, we discover hundreds of new genes um, in, across all of the pathways that we look at. Um, and we can really validate that these genes have high specificity uh, as well. So there's a lot that we can do um, with this data. Um, similar to the Hakoan lab, we show that we can diagnose inflammatory responses with very high specificity. Um, so for example, we can diagnose between um, closely related interferon um, pathways um, in COVID-19 responses. Um, we can quantify the activation of different signaling pathways in spatial data. For example, we can pinpoint where a TGF beta wound response is driven in a wound specific colitis model. Um, we can even predict specific genetic regulators which are knocked out. Um, for example, based on the gene expression signature, we can identify that there is a specific defect in IRF1 dependent signaling. So, you know, I think one thing that's really exciting about our study is that the signatures that we learn, you know, we learn them in human cell lines, but then we can apply them successfully in many different biological contexts. The first example is in primary immune cells, the second example is in the mouse colon, and the third is actually from bats. Um, so we can really map new and diverse data onto our dictionary. Um, so we think this is an exciting new direction for the field and that many groups will start to build and assemble similar types of perturbation dictionaries. In fact, the space of possible perturbations is much larger than the number of human cell types. And so we think this will be a major growth driver and area for the field. Um, to learn more, um, Longa and Carol in my lab will be speaking about both of these papers later today. All right, I'll pivot um, for the last time um, today to our last highlight, again, focusing on spatial data. And over the last year, I've noticed that there's been a new type of analysis that's really becoming quite prominent. It's always been common to do sort of unsupervised clustering of spatial data. This is the star map mouse brain and, and see where different clusters fall spatially. Um, and sometimes you have clusters that are very spatially restricted, but other times clusters are sort of falling interspersed across spatial locations. And, and that's, that's not wrong, that's true biology. Um, but people have realized that when we do spatial analysis, we don't just want to map cell types, we may want to define regions of a tissue that have a similar overall molecular profile. And some people call these domains or tissue regions or, or niches, like you can see here. But identifying and segmenting these regions has become an important computational problem. Um, and there are lots of new methods that do this. Um, one that I think is effective and works well is called SPIN, or spatial integration from Zhao Wang's lab. Um, this smooths cells from a local neighborhood, so effectively augmenting a cell's expression in a clever way with the expression of its neighbors. Um, and now you can cluster this data to define cellular regions, and this works very wonderfully in the mouse brain and many tissues. But what I really like about this paper is it goes far beyond clustering. 
they point out that all the tasks that we typically do at the single cell level, whether it's clustering or trajectory inf inference or integration, you could do that at the tissue domain level as well. So for example, they take two data sets, a marmoset SARMAP data set and a mouse Visium data set, and they integrate them and jointly call tissue domains across the data sets. And that means that you can discover cortical layers that map from the marmoset onto the mouse. You can seamlessly compare the upper and lower levels of the cortex across species. And I think that's really quite cool. Um, the method is straightforward, but, but I think conceptually, it's a nice way to think about how to do comparative analysis of spatial samples. Another method we really like is, is appropriately named Banksy from Shams Prabhakar's group in, in Singapore. Um, it also uses this idea of augmentation, augmenting a cell's own expression profile with that of its neighbors. But additionally, it also considers the gradient of molecular expression, which they, which they estimate with the Gabor filter that's commonly used in image analysis. This gradient is a good idea because there are often sharp layers in spatial data, like in the brain, and you don't want to perform smoothing across uh, those layers. So taking this gradient into account really helps the model perform better when there are sharp transitions in between regions. So the Banksy model takes all three things into account and you can actually weigh how much you want to value these different components. You can cluster data in a completely unsupervised non-spatial way, um, or you can start to look um, for different spatial um, domains. And so this is really a nice method. There's also nice software associated with it. And I appreciate that the authors created a wrapper for it to be easily used with Surat, um, as we have been doing in my lab. Um, so I encourage others to try it out. Um, and there are, you know, I'll just end by saying there have been a number of methods profiled um, that aim to define these tissue regions or cellular neighborhoods or, or, or niches. I can't discuss them all, but I, I really do think this is going to be an active area of computational development um, going forward. Um, all right, so that wraps up, you know, my overview of, of recent advances. It's, it's quite a roller coaster, but it's always fun um, for me to give this talk and to really acknowledge and, and celebrate the amazing work from this community over the past year. Um, thanks very much for listening, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Rahul. Um, now we'll be taking some questions from the audience. So our first question is, are there differences on the unmapped reads from sequencing across and within cell types in bulk versus single cell seq? So that's a complicated but but good question. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that the answer is, is going to be both. Uh, I'm sure that there are cases where even within a cell type, um, there could be allele specific expression, there could be differences in alternative splicing, there could be differences in viral activation, um, and that would lead to um, differences in the unmapped reads. Um, but of course, there also might be very strong differences across cell types as well, and, and that's typically why we perform single cell sequencing. Um, and I hope that these, these signals could be even stronger in single cell data compared to bulk because we can more clearly emphasize biological differences between closely related cell types. Well, thank you. Um, so the second question is, what are some immediate ways that researchers can make use of foundation models and where do these predictions fit into larger biological stories? Yeah, that's a great question and something we're starting to explore in my lab. And, and so I think, you know, these are these are early days for for some of these foundation models. But many of the authors, um, but most of them, if not all of them, have made their, their code and models available. And I think many of our labs are just starting to work those types of methods into our standard single cell analysis pipelines. And I think we're going to discover over the next year whether they sort of completely replace existing methods or, or as I expect, they'll probably be more of a, of a complement to the types of other analyses that we're already doing. Um, but certainly, you know, as data starts to grow and models start to get better, you know, those types of trends will, will change and update. So I think it's very exciting. Great, great. Um, our final question, which is a pretty broad one, is what are you hoping to see and discuss by next year's Single Cell Genomics Day? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's always something that we think about a little bit every year. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting, and I'll end on this today for, for me, was a lot of the methods that I talked about were not entirely new conceptual questions. There are questions that people have thought about or tried to tackle before, um, but there are new advances in that area. And so, for example, barcoding cellular interactions and inferring cellular time are, are examples of problems that are not new, um, but we're making sort of new methodological and conceptual advances. And I think that's where the field is going. You know, we, it's not that we're asking entirely new types of questions, but we're coming up with more scalable, more experimentally validated um, and just more innovative ways of answering questions we already know. And I, I think that's a trend that's going to continue certainly for quite some time as, as the field matures. Great. Sounds good. Thank you so much.